I'll just maybe preface this by saying I'm really thankful you're here, uh, especially after last night. Um, <laughs> I thought about just beginning the session and say, you know what, the goal is to uh, learn to fight purity. So if you want to do that, if you want to do that in your own life better, if you want to help other people do that, then all you need to do is download Robbie's message from last night and just keep replaying it to yourself. Right? That should be it. You guys can go now. We're all done. Uh, uh, in all seriousness, my objective this morning is really to take um, what Robbie gave us last night as an incredible foundation. I want to build off that. My desire is to give you some practical steps for how to move forward in the fight for purity. And I think it's essential that we hear a message like we did last night. We are reminded of the seriousness of this struggle. We're reminded of, I I think, um, how rampant this struggle is in men, not only in the secular sense, but in the church of Jesus Christ. Um, We're foolish to think that we can be untouched by this. In fact, many of you in here may be significantly touched by this, either in your past, in your present, and maybe even in your future. It's imperative that we understand how to handle this problem, and the gravity of this sin cannot be overstated. And I want to say this too. Some of you are here because you need uh, some foundational uh, hooks for your life and able to be able to move forward in this fight. Some of you here are going to really grow in your ability to fight the fight for purity. But I think one of the things you need to see is this. Because of the extensive nature of this battle, it means this. Every day, whether you're battling this in your life, somebody else around you is. And I believe with all my heart that if you've got victory over this, this area of your life, praise God, but God wants to use you to help the men in your church find victory as well. So the path I'm going to lay is not just for you, it's for you to be able to take and to help others apply so that they can achieve victory. If, if what Robbie said is true last night, what the, the biblical counselor here told him, that one of the greatest hindrances to revival in the church today is the sex, sin of sexual immorality, How important is it for us to get this figured out in our lives and then to be used by God to help other men around us get this figured out? What a privilege and a joy it is to be able to see progress in our lives and progress in the lives of others. What Robbie laid out last night was just an incredible foundation of how serious this sin is. Um, You heard the main theme of that last night. Just this, this is serious. And it's serious for a lot of different reasons because of the offense it is to God, but I think it's serious too because purity produces strength and stability for the Christian life. Just hear me say that again. Purity produces strength and stability for the Christian life. One of the greatest things that you can experience in the Christian life is a clear conscience. Do you know that? Do you know how many men are hindered from walking a faithful walk with Christ because their consciences are not clear because of how they're daily giving in, not just to sin, but specifically to sexual sin. How awesome is it to be able to stand with confidence and talk with a clear conscience about the importance of purity, how desperately we ought to desire that in our own lives, how much strength and stability that does God want to produce in our lives as we continue to win the battle in purity. Here's our problem. Oftentimes, and I guess this probably is shifting maybe even for some of you from last night, we don't see sin in general as being that bad. We become comfortable with our sin. We get used to our sin. Our sin becomes uh, a part of who we are in some small way. It actually becomes a way in which we have learned to identify ourselves. And when it comes to sexual sin, I love what Robbie said last night. We we talk about how sex sells, but we fail to talk often about how sex kills. Um, The the analogy that I think is really helpful for sexual sin is is that of a a polar bear trap. Have you guys ever heard about how um, oftentimes um, in the, the cold cold, cold places where polar bears are roaming around, they they tend to catch or kill polar bears. Kind of an ancient way to do this was that the Inuit would take a double-edged knife, a long blade, and what they would do is they would paint it with seal's blood. And what they would do is they would just layer it. They would coat it, and then they would let it dry. They'd coat it again, then they'd let it dry. And they would build up a thick layer of seal's blood, dry seal blood around this blade. Then what they would do is they'd go outside, and they'd stick it butt end into the snow. You know, they'd kind of anchor it in there so it wouldn't move. And then all of a sudden, a polar bear would come along, and they'd smell uh, the, the, the seal's blood. And the allure of that, the temptation of that, would cause them to come and indulge in just starting to lick up, lap up the blood. And eventually, as they continued to lick and uncover the layers, all of a sudden they would be surrounded by a pool of blood, not realizing that the blood was their very own. The thing that they pursued 
the thing that they desired, the thing that was satisfying an instant craving was the very thing that would eventually kill them. Most men don't realize that what they're doing when it comes to sexual sin, whether that be pornography or whether that be indulging in other forms of sexual immorality, the thing we devour is the very thing that's killing us often before we even realize that's what's happening. It's hollowing us out. That's what sexual sin does. Many of us have experienced this in our lives. It makes us a shell of the man we once were. It strips us of dignity. It robs us of strength and joy. Proverbs 6.23, listen to this, says that it reduces our life to a loaf of bread. Think about that. To nothing of value. It literally destroys our life. It ruins it. It strips the value away from our life if that's what we choose to pursue. It kills and destroys And because of that, it's a battle that all of us must fight with increasing vigilance as the culture around us inundates us with opportunities to indulge ourselves, inundates us with a message that wants to tell us that sexual perversion is not just acceptable, it's something that we should be exploring. Um, There are varying degrees of struggle, of discouragement, and of setbacks, even in this room. There are varying degrees of victory that have been experienced in this room, but the reality is that this is a battle that every Christian can and must win. That's the hope of this message. Paul says this, listen, in Colossians 3, he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Um, Ted quoted this last night. Put to death what is earthly in you. Listen, the battle is within you, but listen, listen to what Paul follows that phrase with. What's earthly within you? Listen to what he says. The first thing, sexual immorality. Listen to this, though. He he goes on. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He begins by highlighting sexual morality, and what he links it to, I want you to see this, is worship. It's a worship disorder. So the question that we're facing in this workshop is how? How do we do this effectively? I get the seriousness, and hopefully that is just drilled into you from last night. I understand a lot of what the Bible calls me to, but how do I do this effectively? How do I walk this out in my life on a daily basis? How do I stop sinning? And how do I stop this sin that is so often so deeply rooted, that is so often so stubborn and habitual? It's a sin that most men I talk to who struggle with this utterly detest and hate and yet cannot gain ground. And the steps I want to give you can help you, again, like I said, personally, but they can help you bring others along a path to freedom. So I want to walk through two major categories, and within each category, I'm going to give you four or five steps to follow, okay? I want to break this down in two big categories, two big buckets. The first bucket is this. You need to feel the shame of impurity. This is the starting point to really gaining ground and seeing victory over purity in your life. You need to feel the shame of impurity. Now, let me qualify that by saying, you know, I know know Robbie last night said we're, you know, we're not supposed to feel guilty or shame. That's what the Satan, that's what Satan wants us to feel. Let me qualify that. And he would agree with this. Um, That's not entirely true. That's kind of a broad overstatement. The devil wants you to live in shame and guilt. He wants you to stay in shame and guilt. But just consider this for a minute. I mean, oftentimes when we struggle with sin in general, but let's just use sexual sin since it is the topic of this this workshop. When we struggle with sexual sin, we often feel guilty, don't we? And some of you are like, I don't like feeling guilty. Like, I don't don't like feeling guilty. Listen, isn't it true that the reason we feel guilty is because we are guilty? We, we, We are guilty, and that's part of the convicting work of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God wants us to be able to say, I'm guilty. I committed that. The Spirit of God wants us to feel shame over our sin. The Spirit of God doesn't want us dancing around in our sin, glorying in our shame. He wants us to feel the weight of our shame. And so I just want to say, and we're going to get to the good stuff, okay? So so hang in there. If you're like, man, this is going to be a depressing workshop. Hang in there. We're going to get to the grace. But before we get to the grace, we need to start with the shame. You need to feel the shame. Let me just make this very clear. To feel the shame and to live in the shame are two very different things, okay? You need to make that distinction. So, very few sins produce the kind of discouragement and bondage that sexual sin produces. Sexual sin is 
uh, uniquely enslaving kind of sin. It has a uniquely enslaving quality to it. And some of you are, are, are maybe used to hearing the phrase, you know, all sin is sin, right? All sins are essentially the same. Yes, but no. You know, the Bible makes distinctions between sins. All sin is punishable by God, amen? All sin is worthy of death. All sin is grievous to God. But not all sin is equal. Not all sin is equal in its offense. Not all sin is equal in its consequences. If you don't believe me, just look at the Ten Commandments. There are certain sins, even in the Ten Commandments, that are punishable by death, right? Other sins that are not. But there are certain sins that are far more enslaving than others. And as men, I think we understand this when it comes to sexual sin. Some sins are incredibly powerful in our lives. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. It should be on the screen behind me here. Listen to how Paul highlights and elevates sexual sin as a serious sin. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. Now, listen, just look what Paul's doing. He's making a distinction between sexual sin and all other sins. That's what he's doing here. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. There's a unique offense that's being committed. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You see, he links the uniqueness of sexual sin to sinning against the body, which has now become, as a follower of Christ, the temple, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Here's what he's saying. Sexual sin is a unique offense against the Spirit of God. By the way, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8, emphasizes this point as well. That's why at the very end of what Paul draws into the equation is the Holy Spirit, right? He's whom, the Holy Spirit whom he has given to you. What he's doing is he's elevating the seriousness of the sin against the Spirit of God. So I think it's just incredibly important to see and to understand the seriousness of the struggle with this particular sin and why we need to take it more seriously. So here's what you need to do. You feel the shame of the impurity. The first kind of sub point there, the, the first uh, step in the path to purity is this, determine the seriousness of your struggle. Or if you've got victory over this area of your sin and you're discipling others in this area, then, then here's what you need to do. You need to help them determine the seriousness of the struggle for their life. What does this look like in their life? You see, all struggle is bad, but not all struggle is equal. I will never forget, I was interviewing um, uh, a a man for a job at our church, a position at our church, and uh, I didn't know him. He was coming from from out of town. It wasn't from our church, and one of the first questions I I asked him was, I looked at him in the eyes and said, how often are you looking at porn? By the way, if you're discipling others, that's the question you ask them, okay? Not, are you looking at porn, okay? Here's why. This is a little pastoral trick, okay? This one's for free. Just tuck this in your back pocket. When you assume they are, it rattles them in a different way. Like if I was to walk up to any one of you and look in the eye and ask you that question, how often are you looking at porn? You know what instantly happens? The weight of conviction is different than are you. It, are you is a lot easier to score them away from. How often? You can get caught up in trying to, uh, oh, whoa, uh, uh. <laughs> This, this guy looked at me, and, and you know, his head sinks, and instantly, see, this is it. The other thing is you see body language. His head sinks, and instantly he starts talking about how he struggles um, with some immorality and that he's been viewing some stuff online, and instantly I'm like, okay, this interview's over. I'm like, there's no way. But, but listen, as I dug into it, you want to know what I found out? Every once in a while, he was coming across uh, YouTube videos, workout videos with scantily clad women in them, and that, to him, was the immorality he was indulging in or looking at, and it was very, very infrequent. And you see, that's very different than the other guy that I've talked to who is looking at pornography every day for hours on end. Now, both struggles are a problem, but they're not the same. And and I say that not to get one off the hook. I just say that because it's important to evaluate the seriousness of your personal struggle to figure out where somebody's really at with this problem because that's going to help you tailor the approach you take with them. The most serious sins are the ones that have gone so deep that they're now habitual. 
Your subconscious habits now lead you to sin again and again and again. It's almost like, you know, this is how you can tell a, a sin in your life is incredibly serious, and sexual sin in particular. It's almost like you just go into autopilot. It's just the habit. It's just what you do, the time, the place. Everything has been predetermined. You just constantly are falling into the same thing over and over, and it's like there's no, there's no governor on that at all. Nothing restraining, nothing pulling you back. How do you tell if a sin is, is serious? It's become incredibly deep and habitual. You need to ask this question. You need to be looking at the increased frequency and intensity because that looks at the increased sense of depravity of the sin. Ask this question. Is this sin manifested in your habits? Is this sin on autopilot? Here's a really helpful question to ask yourself or to ask those you're discipling. Has it become far easier to sin than to fight and do what's right? You ever been there with sin? It's just like, I know it's right, but I don't care. It's so much easier and so much more satisfying, sadly, in my sinful flesh to just do what I know is wrong. If that's where you're at or if that's where the person you're working with is at, your sin is deep and it will require a ramped up approach to help set you free. That's what we're looking at here. So here's the second step you need to take in a path of purity. Remember, we're feeling the weight of shame. Here's here's what what the second thought is here. Sit under the weight of your sin. Sit under the weight of your sin. By the way, this is what Robbie did to us last night, right? This is what good preaching does, by the way. It allows us to sit under the weight of our sin, to feel the weight of our sin in a profound way. Regardless of the seriousness of the struggle, what we need to be able to do is fill our hearts and minds with the seriousness of this sin and all sin. And the Bible is very clear, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. The weight of that needs to sit upon us. The the guilt that we feel needs to be experienced in our lives. We truly need to come to grips with the weight of it all. Why? Because sin always tries to convince you that it's not that bad or serious. Okay? Sin is deceptive. Sin wants to convince you that it's really not that big of a problem. Okay? I can't tell you how many men I've dealt with in this area of their life where where they'll talk, yeah, you know what, I dabble in pornography, but it's really not that big of an issue. Listen, I'll I'll paraphrase Robbie because I feel like he had the liberty to say it, and I'll just piggyback over him. Are you that dumb? Really? Like, seriously? You you can dab, like, can a man hold fire on his lap and not be burned, right? This is what Proverbs says. This This is the epitome of foolishness to think that your sin isn't that bad or that serious, One of the things we love to do, instead of feel the weight of our sin, to avoid the weight of our sin, what we do is we want to compare our struggle to the struggle of others. Isn't it true? I mean, or or we compare it to where we've been in the past. It's not as bad as it used to be, or I, I know people who have it much worse, right? That's a way, listen, of justifying what we're doing. It's a way of somehow... Um, alleviating the guilt that we feel in our own conscience, making ourselves feel okay with it. Sometimes we just say, you know, it's just a small sin. One, one of the most powerful verses that I have used in my own personal life to continue to fight for purity, and I want to commend it to you, is a uh, song of, of songs uh, 215. Okay, here's, here's just the, what it says. It's the little foxes that spoil the vineyards. This is Solomon's wisdom. And you know what precedes that? Catch the little foxes. You know, you can see the analogy, can't you? Can't you see the vivid imagery? It's just, you let the little foxes in, they begin to, you know, oh, they're not, they're just small, they're not going to do that much damage. Before you know it, there's a bunch of little foxes running around, and the whole vineyard's destroyed. So he says, catch, catch the little foxes. They're the ones that spoil the vineyards. Man, you, you got to come to grips with this. Every little sin, especially in the area of impurity, is a serious offense against God. It's incredibly weighty and it's important that you feel the weight of this. God wants you to know that your t- sin is eternally serious and it is worth worrying about. Listen, if you treat sin lightly, you will pay for it heavily. If you treat sin lightly, you will pay for it heavily. You need to consider just how dangerous your sin is, how it dishonors God, how it leads to discipline in your life from the hand of God, how it damages those that you say that you love and those that you really do love. 
You need to see how it strips you of your usefulness and joy. Robbie painted this picture so profoundly last night. Men, we fail to recognize. Listen, I, 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 I dealt with somebody this week, this week, who has literally destroyed their life because of sexual sin. And it all started with a small fox in the vineyard. And right now on the brink of losing his entire marriage and his family. First Corinthians 6, 9, just listen to this. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Okay, don't be deceived about how serious this sin is. Listen, listen to what the word of God says. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. And, and the list is long, but I just want you to see the emphasis here. Like sexual sin is a big deal to God. It's such a big deal. It needs to be a big deal to us. The reason we often run back to it so quickly, men, and this is true, isn't it? Don't you see this in your own life? The temptation, you're like, you feel this weight and then you run back to it. You feel the weight again, then you run back to it. You're like, why do I keep doing this? It's because, I believe this all in my heart, it's because we have not sat under the weight of it sufficiently. That's why we can run back to it so quickly and so easily. The weight of it is not sinking in the way it ought to. And here's what I want to advise you to do. Don't run to grace too quickly. Now, some of you are like, what? That doesn't make sense, Ian. Don't you believe the gospel? Yes, I do, but bear with me. We, we love grace, Amen. We love the mercy of God. We love the compassion of God. We love the love of God. Listen, but to really love those things, we have to hate sin. You really want to love grace? You want to see grace empower your life to a different degree? You have to ramp up the hatred of sin, which means you must feel the weight of it in your life. You can't run past it. You can't leap over it. You can't go around it. You have to sit under it. And in my experience, and especially working with men, there's a a real desire to just move past the weight of it quickly. Just get me to grace. I just want to, listen, I just want to feel better about myself. And I'm always like, hold on. I want you to feel better too, but I I, I want you to feel better when you realize how big of a deal this is, because I'm not convinced that that's that's where you're at yet. And my fear is, is if you don't get this, guess where you're running right back to when you leave this place? Sin. Every time, guys, every time. So here's the third thing. Here's the third step. Take complete ownership of your sin. This is what it leads to, right? You're sitting under the weight. You're talking about your sin. You're thinking about your sin and how serious it is. This is how you do it. You just go back to the word of God. You let the word of God remind you of how serious this sin is, the weightiness of it. And then what it forces you to do is to take complete ownership of your sin. You let your conscience fulfill its God-ordained function. Romans chapter 2 says the conscience is given by God to either accuse or excuse, right? Right? Fueled by the Spirit of God, the conscience is a good tool. It's not a perfect guide. It malfunctions because of sin. But under the sovereign hand of God and with the Spirit of God at work, our conscience is used by God to accuse or excuse us. So here's what we need to do is we need to let the Holy Spirit do his loving role in our lives. The Spirit of God came to do three things. To convict the world. It's not only three. This is a broad statement. To convict the world of what? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit of God is constantly doing these things in the life of unbelievers, but listen, he's doing this in the life of believers. The Spirit of God is a gift to you and I, and he wants to convict us of our sin, our righteousness, or lack thereof, and the judgment for sin, either that we will pay or that has been paid on our behalf. Let the Spirit of God do that. Now, the Spirit of God uses means to help us own our sin. And one of my concerns, again, is that we want to try to avoid dealing with our sin or move past our sin. And the story that comes to my mind about the convicting work of the Spirit of God, and by the way, of letting sin continue to rest on your heart, the weight of it is, is the story of David. David. You guys know the story of David, right? And Bathsheba and obviously his sexual immorality and the cover-up that went into it. But then the most profound part of that whole story, I think, is, is when Nathan the prophet comes to David. You remember that story? You remember Nathan the prophet comes and he tells him this great story, right? He's like, hey, hey, David, what would you do, right? A guy comes to town and 
He steals a sheep from a poor guy who's only got one. Instead of using his own sheep to host this big dinner, he kills this man's sheep. I mean, can you believe that? And David is outraged. He's furious, right? He's furious. Bring this man to me right now. Let's put him to death for what he's done. And Nathan just looks at him and he goes, David, you're the man. Now, now, I just want you to know is what David, what Nathan did not do in that moment. David, it's okay though. God's gracious. Don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, David. God's going to forgive you. What did he do? He let the weight of the situation rest upon David. Why? Why? Because it had to break him. It had to bring him to this place of complete ownership. Oh, this is me. I've done this. And, and doesn't David break on This is what God uses to break him, isn't it? You're the man. You're the man, David. And David just crumbles under the weight of his sin, and he owns it. And now we have the beauty of the Psalms, like Psalm 32, which we'll look at in a minute. Psalm 51, we see David owning his sin in such a profound and powerful way. And this is part of the key to being able to move forward, owning our sin for what it is. And just think about the opposite of this, because this is where a lot of men are stuck. You say, I I own my sin before God. Really? Acknowledging your sin and owning your sin are two different things. So so here's what happens, and and David's the example for us in many ways. Remember what David did? Did, Do you know how long it took? Anybody anybody know how long it took David to break? Like, do you know when this event took place? About About a year. Here is David. A man after God's own heart. Isn't this awesome? A man after God's own heart. Here he is. All the while, what does he do instead of owning his sin? What does he do? He covers it up. He murders. He conceals. He deceives. Does David know what he did? Yeah, he knows what he did. But he hasn't owned what he did. And man, listen, our, one of our greatest problems is that our lack of ownership is shown in the way we want to cover up our sin, delete our browser history really quickly, quickly shut down the computer or the page, quickly pretend like we weren't looking at that woman, we were looking past the woman, right? Okay. Okay. We love to conceal instead of own And we need to let the, you say, how do I do this? We need to let the gospel remind us of how patient and kind God has been with us in allowing to go on in our sin without striking us dead on the spot. So we go to the gospel first. Listen, not for forgiveness. Just follow it. We're going to get there. But we go first to the gospel to feel the weight of the sin and to find ownership for our sin to get a better sense of the gravity. Listen, when you go to the gospel first, it needs to be to sense the cost of your sin, okay? We go to the cross first because there we see how much our sin costs God, don't we? I mean, it costs God his own son. That's what Nathan did with David. What's the cost, David? What do you deserve, David? Exactly what you think that man deserved, David. That's what you deserve, David. You deserve death for your sin, David. Every one of us, that's us. We look in the mirror and we say, that's what my sin. I look at the cross and the sin shows me I deserve death. God is kind and patient. He has not struck me dead. He's given me another chance today. It's the kindness of God that's leading me to repentance. By the way, this principle has been long embraced, this idea that you've got you to gotta sit under the weight of this. I mean, Charles Spurgeon said, you know, if you gave him, an, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, you gave him you know, an hour to preach the gospel, he'd spend 90% of the time preaching about the bad news, Right? And then 10% speaking about the good. Why? We know this, right? But we can't appreciate the good news of God's grace until we understand the seriousness and the heinousness of sin. God's grace is so amazing when we understand how, how bad and wretched our sin is. So here's what I want to say. So when you're wrestling through this in your own life, just whatever degree of lust you're facing, because we all face the temptation of lust, we all face the battle with lust, or you're helping people, here's what you need to do. You need to come back to looking at the cross. And here's what I want to encourage you. Like, you need to visualize this. Like you need to sit in this, and you need to soak in this, and you need to force other people to do the same thing. Can you see Christ, listen, on the cross, suffering? We, do, we, we, we think Christ suffers just ambiguously for sin, broadly for sin. Listen, one of the greatest things you can learn to do as a general practice in your life in the battle against sin is learn to see Jesus Christ suffering for your particular sins. 
Like, look at the cross. Can you see Jesus there suffering for your sin? If you were the only person in the world, Jesus Christ would have hung on the cross for you. Do you know that? He loves you that much. But see him suffering for your sins. See, see the shame that's heaped upon him. See the torture. See the, the rebukes. See the humiliation and the belittling and fix your gaze there on him. Feel the weight. Feel the guilt. Feel the shame. Let it continue to sink in. Take ownership of what you've done. I mean, I can't sing this, this lyric in the hymn. It gets me every time, but I, I love it. I love it and I hate it, right? It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. Like just... Like, oh, you get used to saying that, man. Get used to believing that with all of your heart. And that moves you to this next step. Again, we're still under the, the bucket of feeling the shame of our sin. Express deep sorrow over your sin and a longing for freedom from it. Let me just remind you how David responded to this. In Psalm 32, it says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression gression is forgiven, whose sin is covered Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, he could only say that because of this right here. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away though my groaning, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged, here it is, man, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Can you just see David just saying, guys, do what I did. Just break under the weight, take ownership, and then go to God and express this deep sorrow and this longing for freedom. You say, what if I don't feel like this? Like, what if I don't have this feeling in my heart? What if, I, what if I'm, I've been trying to get there and, I, and I, it's not happening? Listen, the greatest advice I can give you is this. Get alone with God. Get on your knees and pray and pray and beg God to break you and convict you and cause you to weep over your sin, and stay there until he does it. Don't leave. Stay there. And allow him to produce a sorrow in your heart, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Don't leave until he gives it. Long for the freedom and deliverance that only he can offer. Get to the end of your rope. Get, get to the place where you say, I can't, I, I can't keep doing this my way. My, my way has not been working. I've said I'm not going to do this a hundred times. I've said I'm going to stop looking. i said I'm going to turn my gaze, and I haven't done it. I can't do it. You've got to get to that place. And when you feel the weight of your sin, only then will you want to put that sin to death for the best reasons. This is often the difference between a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 7. And, and this is where I think a lot of, a lot of people live um, in this sense of worldly sorrow. It's a, it's, a, it's a sorrow that's produced oftentimes because we got caught, because we're humiliated or embarrassed, or because we just we don't like it, but you know we, we kind of want to change it, but not really... Paul says this, he says, as it is, I rejoice. By the way, Paul writes this letter, and you need to hear this again. This is a consistent theme. He says he wrote this letter, um, and, it, and it, he intended to grieve them, okay? This is what Paul, he says this, 2 Corinthians 7. Paul wrote it to produce grief in their hearts. Again, this is for the, some of us who are just uber grace people, and we don't, want, we don't want to talk about sin too much. Paul wrote the letter to grieve them. Here's what he says. As is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. See that? For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. How many times have we been stuck in the worldly grief cycle? Right? Where we just kind of repeat the cycle back, okay, I'm sorry, God, and we go right, like, right back into it. I'm sorry, God, right back into it. I'm sorry, God. No progress, no growth at all. And what God says here is that there is a different kind of grief that produces a salvation, life, growth, progress, sanctification. 
For see what earnestness, he says, this is how he describes it, this godly grief is produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. He's not saying they didn't do anything wrong. What he's saying is they did everything possible to remove this from their lives so that it was no longer the stigma that stained their lives. That's what godly grief looks like. The difference is that we no longer hate the sin merely because of the consequence, the fear and the shame and the embarrassment, or because we got caught, but because of what it cost God. What it's going, or what it's doing to bring reproach on the name of Christ and how it's limiting you from bringing glory to Christ. This is what we need to, to remember and what we need to help others remember. If you don't get to the place of longing for, of panting for, of crying out for this kind of deliverance, any victory you experience will be short-lived. Godly sorrow leads to true repentance. And true repentance is always a turning away and walking in the other direction by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, second bucket, and this is where we're going to get a little bit more uh, joyful. Uh, Fight for the joy of purity. Now, all of this has been part of the fight, but sitting under the weight and guilt and shame of our sin is healthy and helpful for us to now experience the joy in the fight and the progress in, in a maybe more practical sense of our thinking. And the first way we need to do that is by doing this. Admit the struggle to others who will help you in the battle. Now, I'm using David kind of throughout this as an analogy for our lives. See, what David did first was incredibly important. David stops and he confesses his sin first to who? To God. Then what does David do? Who does he confess it to? Have you read Psalm 51? Everyone. Okay, Here, here's, now listen, I'm, hold on, let's not carry this analogy too far. I'm not saying you got to go in front of your church on Sunday and confess to them, you know, or tell your disciple that their struggle with pornography is just, that's not what I'm saying. Or I committed adultery 10 years, you don't have to do that. But what, I, what I'm saying is David provides an example of the liberating power of confession of sin, not just to God, but to others. And in fact, one of the things that God allows David to do is confess his sin, not just to the people of Israel, but to all people for all time who have the word of God. Guys, guys, this, this here, that I really want you guys to, 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 to hear this part in particular, because this, I believe, is where most men lose the battle. Right here. Even after feeling the weight of your sin, the shame of your sin, and looking to the cross, we can get hung up here, and this here can be the linchpin that changes everything in our battle for purity. This is arguably one of the most important aspects of the battle. I have watched men rise and fall on this principle alone. And in fact, I would say this to you, true brokenness over sin leads to an increased desire to confess that sin both to God and others. And in fact, James talks about this in James 5, 16. He talks about the importance of confessing. He says, therefore, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I go to lots of places in Scripture to show you the implications of confessing sin to one another. And this is, listen, again, for men, this is oftentimes really hard. Um, and sometimes there's a generational gap here where, 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 you know, maybe we've grown up in a generation where men don't share their feelings. Men don't talk about their struggles. But can I just tell you, men, that that's one of the reasons why men are stuck in their sin. Hiding sin does nothing but cultivate sin. You need to believe that. You need to buy into that right now. Hiding sin does nothing but cultivate sin. Satan's desire as well um, is to cause you to hide sin. Your prideful flesh wants you to hide and conceal sin. This is what, this is, what is working against us in this battle. The Spirit's work is in exposing sin. This is what the Spirit of God does, doesn't he? The Spirit of God comes alongside you. And this is, by the way, the moment of salvation... Okay, And in the moments of sanctification, what does the Spirit of God love to do? He loves to put a floodlight on your sin, doesn't he? He highlights your sin, he exposes it for what it is, so that you can confess it and repent of it and deal with it in an appropriate way. So the Spirit's work is to expose sin, so we need to be found not working against what the Spirit is trying to do in our lives. Exposing sin brings freedom from sin. Sin that is brought out of darkness into the light loses its power and its grip. 
If you don't believe me, just do a, 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 an experiment with this. Just try it. You know, just like humor me and just try this in your own life. Just expose whatever that struggle is to somebody else. Let them know what's going on. The power of sexual sin in particular often lies in its desire to remain hidden. One of the things that I have experienced in my, uh, my, my pastoral ministry and counseling ministry and This is really fresh in my mind because I've just dealt with two really significant cases of people who have fallen into grievous sexual sin and are on the verge of losing everything. Um, Literally in the last two weeks, heartbreaking. But in every situation, listen, you want to know what I find out? It's like peeling back the layers of an onion. And here's what I found. Every one of them that sits now in my office and, and with brokenness, oftentimes, listen, because of their sin and, and what they've committed and how they're about to lose it, what they can do is they can begin to trace back steps of how this has all gone wrong. And inevitably, it started at what they thought was a very small, inconsequential place. And it began to progress and snowball and grow in their life. And listen, I can tell you this. I can tell you this firsthand. Some of you men, you know this, and you've been fighting this battle in your own hearts. There are points along the way, and they'll tell me, they'll say, I knew right then I should have told somebody. I knew I should have confessed. I knew I should have come for help at this stage. I knew it was a problem here, but I I thought I could handle it. I thought I could deal with it. I thought I could get it under control. And then it progressed to this. And I knew at that point too, I should just tell somebody. And then before long, before long, listen, they're at the edge of the cliff and they've stepped over. Men, don't be that dumb. Don't be that foolish. Don't be that man. Don't be that man who's so prideful that you think that you're the one, you're the one exception to the rule, that you're going to be the one who's going to be able to figure it out all by yourself and you don't need any help from anybody else. Be the exception to the rule that doesn't need to obey the scriptures to confess your sin to others. Just be that exception and see how it works for you. I promise you, men, listen, it will not lead you to a good place. And some of you here, you may be at the place where you're like, I'm already at this place where I'm further than I ever thought I would be. Listen, my exhortation to you right now is this. You leave this room, you leave this conference, you pull somebody aside and you share right away what's going on. Now, listen, Here's the danger. The danger in confessing our sin is that we love to share a small part of our sin. A recent case example for me was that I thought, again, I knew the struggle. I thought we'd had conversations. You want to know what it turns out? That the years ago when this individual confessed something to me, they actually didn't confess the whole thing. They confessed a part of the sin and felt like that was enough. Men, I'm tracing back, listen, almost a ruined life to this one single event where they chose in a moment of transparency to still conceal aspects of their sin. And you want to know what ended up happening? It ended up fueling, listen, the hidden sin fueled and cultivated the very sin they were trying to fight against. So when you're helping people and when you're trying to fight for purity in your own life, listen, you have to have this kind of humility where you're willing to lay it all on the table. You're willing to say, listen, this is the struggle. This is where I've been. This is what I've done. And I'm not going to be ashamed to tell you because I desperately need the help and I desperately want to see growth in my life. If you want to see growth, you will put everything on the table. That's what I tell men all the time. Everything. And if you withhold anything, I promise you, I just promise you, listen, I've always seen this. There's no exception to this rule I've seen. It will always end up going bad. You'll always end up falling back in. God loves humility, doesn't he? God loves it. He blesses it. Nothing in your life is hidden from God. And and listen, you don't need to be ashamed because of how God thinks of you. Who cares what other people think of you? Who cares what God thinks of you? What God loves about his children is their willingness to do what his spirit is doing, put their sin out for everybody to know about so that they don't care any longer. Now, again, I understand I've qualified that, hopefully. I'm not telling you to stand up in front of the church on Sunday. I need to tell you all something. (laughs) Don't do that. Bring it to the light. Listen, pride, here's what you need to see. At the root, you say, how oftentimes sexual morality is a surface-level sin. Here's what's at the root of of sexual sin in almost every occasion. You know this, men. Pride, selfishness, and ingratitude. Do you know that? Pride, selfishness, and ingratitude are the root level sins that you need to really begin to do work on. Here's why. Pride, pride says, I'm the most important person. 
Pride says, I get what I want. Pride says, I don't care about anyone else. And selfishness is simply an extension of that. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get what I want. I'm willing to sacrifice other people to defraud, as the language of 1 Thessalonians 4 says, other people to get what I want. And listen, ingratitude in Ephesians chapter 5 is talked about as one of the heart issues here. Can can you see that in sexual sin? Why? Because gratitude is one of the antidotes for fighting sexual sin. Gratitude is is reflecting on what God has already given you versus selfishness, which is reflecting on what you don't have. Do you see how that works in an opposing way? If you want to fight uh, uh, the selfishness in your own heart, just start becoming a thankful person. Stop thinking about what you don't have. Start thinking about what God has so graciously already given to you. And all of a sudden, the desire for what you don't have begins to fade because you're so fixated on what God has given to you as an undeserving sinner. Now, um, accountability is often a misunderstood concept, and this is what I'm talking about here when we're talking about sharing the struggle with others. See, often we simply want to tell others and simply uh, treat accountability like a confessional booth. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's like we're sitting down with a priest, we just confess our sin, and then he can absolve us of all guilt, right? We feel better about ourselves. Ha, ah, whew, feels better. My conscience is clear. Now I can go about my day and keep sinning, and I'll see, I'll see you next week where I'll tell you more about what I did. <laughs> like, that's not the way this is supposed to work. True accountability, listen, is for fostering genuine Christian relationships where we help one another, where we strive alongside one another, where, yes, we confess to each other, but for the purpose, listen, of linking arms in the battle for prayer, for exhortation, for being reminded of what is true and what is most important, for praying that God would continue to bring greater deliverance and freedom, for celebrating where God has given victory and for growing that gratitude together. We thank God together when there's victory, amen? It's an awesome thing to sit down with a brother in Christ and he comes to you and says, listen, this has been an awesome week of growth. I mean, I haven't stumbled or fallen yet by the grace of God. Listen, be careful, right? When you think you're standing firm, but praise God, let's keep, let's keep going. Let's keep going after this together. Let's memorize this scripture together. Let's continue to work through this plan together. I just want to encourage you, men, listen, if you have a lone wolf mentality in, a, in the Christian life, you can do it on your own. Listen, a lone wolf is a dead wolf all the time. Lust thrives in secrecy and nothing diffuses it like exposure. One author has said, we're only as sick as our deepest secret. But victory also thrives with real accountability. Ultimately, the battle for purity is won or lost in quietness on our knees with God and in collaboration with our fellow soldiers. This is what we're talking about, fighting the good fight. Accountability can only thrive where there is ongoing transparency, honesty, and humility. Man, this is a really big deal. Oftentimes in our accountability relationships, what happens is we've concealed a sin one time in our accountability relationship. So then what we begin to do is we begin to kind of conceal more and we start pretending like everything's fine when the reality is we start backtracking. Real accountability only thrives where there is ongoing humility and transparency and honesty. Now, here's the next aspect. We need to be reminded of grace, forgiveness, and power. And that's what accountability helps us do. And then we need to take, we need to take drastic measures to win the battles. Drastic measures to win the battles. In Matthew 5, 29 through 30, I think it might be on the screen. No. There it is. Man, a text that's so familiar, right? In, in relation to sexual sin, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body is th- uh, to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Again, this is talking about just taking radical measures in our lives. I mean, the willingness to do whatever it takes to deal with sexual sin. It's been said that tomorrow's character is made out of today's thoughts. You guys have heard the phrase, right? You sow a thought, you uh, reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character, you sow a character, you reap a destiny. Temptation may come suddenly, but sin doesn't. And neither does moral and spiritual fiber and strength. Being a holy, pure man doesn't happen overnight, men. 
It takes time. It takes discipline. It takes diligence. Both of these things result from a process over which we do have some control. By the grace of God and the Spirit of God, He's given us control. He calls us, as we saw last night, to control our own bodies in holiness and in honor. But you just need to know this, that actions, habits, character, and destiny, they all start with a thought, and thoughts are fostered by what we choose to take into our minds. This is what Robbie was talking about last night, being inundated with the culture, allowing ourselves to see certain things that we have no business seeing. We make excuses for seeing a whole lot of garbage these days, men. I mean, some of you are like, well, that's, you're just legalistic. Maybe you're just dumb. Honestly, I'm, I'm so much more convinced of the, the older I get. Listen, I got kids who are growing up really quickly and are being surrounded. Some of you men do too. Surrounded by a hyper-sexualized culture. And I'm telling you, in one sense, it scares me to death, but it, it is increasing my trust and dependence upon the Lord. But one thing I'm appreciating more and more is how vigilant we must be with what we allow to sink into our minds. The battle for purity is won or lost in the mind. Every time bringing every thought captive to Christ. That means that your, your greatest sex organ is your brain, men. What you're fueling it with and what you're not fueling it with is of immense importance. Are you feeding your mind with a passion for Christ? Are you starving your mind of lust? You have to starve it. Whatever you feed will grow stronger. Whatever you starve will eventually diminish and die. That means, men, that we need to be willing to set up boundaries and keep temptation from getting a foothold. By the way, this is all very biblical. Just read through the book of Proverbs, specifically in chapters 5 and 6. A father to his son, guarding him, warning him, don't take that road. Don't walk down that path. You know that woman lives there. What are you thinking? Avoid it. Flee from it. The Bible's not afraid to tell us to do some very specific things. And the boundaries that the scriptures call us to, the boundaries that we need to put in our place to keep temptation from getting a foothold in our lives are based on the premise that our sexual purity cannot be strengthened if we keep doing what we've always done. Okay? If you just keep, men, if you want to keep walking the same path over and over and over, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to strengthen your fight in the purity. You're going to weaken it. You got to stop that. And as we learn to stop feeding lust, we begin to master it. And in time, its demands become less pressing and more manageable to have victory over temptation. We must have a clear goals and sound strategies. We must be willing to do whatever we have to do. Men, listen, you're going to leave this conference all fired up and ready to go fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that, right? I give me on this emotional high, maybe this spiritual high, but the reality is that high is going to leave, and the question is, what are you going to do then? You can't live the Christian life on a spiritual high. You have to live the Christian life with spiritual consistency. That's the battle in the Christian life. It's, it's you know, sanctification has been defined as a long obedience in the same direction. Okay, men? This is what you're after. Not these momentary uh, peaks and valleys, consistency. Yes, falling, but getting back up and moving forward and progressing on to greater heights. You need to evaluate right now, and as you leave this conference, what are the things that are tripping you up in your battle for purity? When do they tend to trip me up? You've got to know this about yourself. What variables are generally present in this struggle? What avenue do I tend to take in my weakness? I mean, is it television? Is it things I'm kind of looking at on television that I'm excusing? I mean, is it your smartphone? I mean, I've had men come to, you know, one of the greatest sources of, of pornography being viewed today is on the, the smartphone. You know what? I've had men come to me and say, my battle is with the phone. The phone is killing me. I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's just there. I'm always tempted. I put software on it. I can't seem to get it. You know what my answer is? Get a flip phone. You don't understand, I really need the internet. Really? No, you really need purity. You need holiness. My God, everybody's got a smartphone. So what? Get rid of, like, if, 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 that's, if the struggle is that serious, listen, I'm not afraid to say, get rid of anything you have to get rid of to get this issue right in your life. And man, we just, that's the drastic measure the scriptures call us to. Do whatever it takes. It is so worth it, you will not regret it. Not one of you is going to get to heaven and stand before Jesus and say, oh man, I really regret not having a smartphone. 
But you may stand before Jesus and say, Lord, I regret the hours and the years I threw away. God, I, I regret, I regret that I ruined my life and I ruined my kids and I ruined my marriage. I regret that I wasn't as faithful as I could have been in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I allowed the sin to get a grip on my life and I wasn't willing to take the steps to get it out of my life. And worship Jesus, not your sinful pursuit. And that's the next part here. We're rounding the corner. Turn your passion over to Jesus. Turn your passion over to Jesus. And Robbie hit this last night. Listen, we worship our way into sin. We worship our way out of sin. And we already looked at 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul talks about our bodies are not our own. We were bought with a price. And I just want you to see that the logic of that text forces us to realize that there is something unique about our sexual sin. And it's because of our union with Christ. There's a particularly heinous, aspect of our sin in uniting Christ to the sexual sin in a really disgusting way. That's why he calls us to flee, flee sexual immorality. And the idea here is that Christ is far too precious to disgrace with this sin. It's far too precious. One of our greatest problems is that we struggle to see how precious our Savior is, and as a result, we do not see how wicked our sin is. And man, have you felt the weight of your sin? You've looked to the cross. You need to then just soak in how precious Jesus is. The greatest way to fight our passion for sin is to have an even greater passion for Jesus Christ. Uh, Thomas Chalmers, the great Puritan, called this the expulsive power of a new affection. I love what John Piper says. He says, when my thirst for joy is satisfied by Christ, sin becomes unattractive. I say no to the passing pleasures of immorality, not because I do not want pleasure, but because I want true pleasure, a greater and lasting pleasure that can be found only in Christ. He says the fire of lust pleasure must be fought with the fire of God's pleasures. If we try to fight the fire of lust with prohibitions and threats alone, even the terrible warnings of Jesus, we fail. We must fight it with a massive promise of superior happiness. We must swallow up the little flicker of lust, pleasure in the conflagration of holy satisfaction. We need to move from being consumers, men of porn and lust, to consumers of Jesus Christ. Scriptures call us to put off, and then they call us to be renewed in our minds by the Scriptures, and then to put on the new man, who we are in Christ, the forgiven man, the empowered man, the man who is filled with the Holy Spirit. I love what Paul writes. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its desires. Do you see that, man? The issue there is who you put on. Not just about what you stop doing, what you start doing, who you start to fixate on, who you start to love and adore. And this, is, this happens, by the way, by the means of grace. We feed our souls on the word of God. We feed our souls in communion with God through prayer. And we trust in Christ's provision and power. That's your final thought for you. And we're going to close with this. Trust Christ's provision and power. I love this. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the foundation, men, as you look forward. This is the hope that we're constantly given. I'm dead to those sins because I have died in Christ, but more than that, I am alive in Christ. There is so much hope here. The life I now live, I live in Christ We need to be giving ourselves fuel for the fight, an arsenal of scripture, an attitude of selflessness and gratitude and humility to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to make sure our identity is rooted in him, not in our sin, to make sure our strength is found in him, standing firm, Paul says, in the strength of his might, that we might walk in newness of life with him. The more you put off the old man and put on the new man, the more you will habitually look like Christ and live in the victory of Christ. Man, there's so much hope and there's so much grace that's offered to us in the battle. There's so much victory for those who are willing to start walking the path of humility. There's so much potential for you in your own growth in this, but for you to be used by God to help so many other men. Man, we need to see a revival in this in our churches. 
So let's commit to getting this right in our own hearts and then committing to come alongside those who are struggling with grace and love and lifting them up and showing them the victory that can be found in Jesus Christ. Amen?